Good morning. We're glad you're here today. And uh, someday we're going to all come together, if not here, in glory. And we welcome all of you online as well. And trust that you are ready to be blessed by the Lord today and to be a blessing to those around you. I have just a few announcements, uh, just some reminders here. Uh, we have uh, got the sanitizer, hand sanitizer, in the back there as you walk in. We thought about putting it right in the middle so people trip over it, but that causes other problems. So if you need hand sanitizer or wish to use it, we have some in the very back and in various places throughout the church. We also have bottles of water back in the back. We've turned off our coolers uh, during this time, just trying to be as precautious as possible. And so if anyone gets thirsty, just go back and get a bottle of water. You also will have noticed there are bulletins. And if you didn't notice, feel free to get all up at once and go get one. Uh, because in the bulletin, you've got the announcements and you have the sermon outline. And you've also got a slip of paper. Go ahead to the next slide. A slip of paper in there that you can fill out and place in these offering boxes uh, that are placed at the back of the sanctuary or downstairs. We also have a lockbox outside uh, for the offerings. And uh, if you choose to use Tithely, it's a wonderful resource that you can set up however you want to set it up. And uh, it just works great. We have several people using that. My wife and I use it. It felt wonderful every Sunday at that we were in church on our vacation. As they were taking the offering, we'd kind of look at each other and I would think, our offering's being taken care of already at St. Albans because it's going through tithing. We didn't have to worry about that. So that was a good thing. And uh, also, you can take that little slip of paper that's folded into your uh, bulletin. You can tear that off. You can fill it out. If you have prayer requests or praises or suggestions, comments, uh, great pictures you want to shoot, whatever, uh, you can write on that and also put that in the box at the back. Uh, the prayer focus, if you want the prayer focus people on Tuesdays to pray for something specifically, just put down prayer focus and then whatever that prayer request might be. So you can put that in the offering boxes as well. There is no youth group this afternoon. And uh, so any, anybody with young people that normally would come to youth group, there is no youth group. So you can have them at home and, and spend some time with them. Also, Christian Education will be meeting at 630 at Patty's uh, Kitchen Table. And so we'll be doing our business there at Patty's Place this Wednesday at 630. So at this time, I'd like to encourage you to stand up and let's worship the Lord through music this morning. Good morning, everyone. It's so good to see everybody.
Father God, thank you for giving us this place so we can gather together here today, so we can come and be with one another, brothers and sisters in Christ, all about your will and way. Press this heavy in our hearts, Lord God, and your will and way is the best way, always. Father God, thank you for pressing it upon our hearts, hearts to open up our eyes to see your hand at work. I pray, Holy Spirit, that our eyes would be open to see the perfect love that you have for us, O oh God, in and through our lives, around our lives. And that's, that's what we focus on, your will and way, O oh God, your will and way.
King, our Savior, our friend, the lover of our souls, our Savior. Thank you, O oh God, for loving on us so much. Thank you, Jesus, for paving in that way. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for opening up our eyes to it. We thank you, O oh God, for loving on us and for making it all possible. You've done all the work. All we have to do is say yes. Then take that and cleanse our hearts, O oh God, so that we can have those clean hands and lift up to you. Your mercies are new every morning. Perfect love you are, unmeasurable love. And all we have to do is ask, repent, change. Thank you, O oh God, for giving us that opportunity. We thank you for hearing our prayers, O oh God. It's nice to be able to come together with, with brothers and sisters and lift up a prayer to you together. But you've given us the opportunity that we can do that anytime we want. Thank you for making that all possible. Father, I pray your blessings upon the rest of the time here, the message that is going to be shared from your word, your perfect word, oh God. Father, I pray your blessings upon the tithes and the offerings given, that you would multiply them within these walls and for outside of these walls, and your kingdom work would continue. It would continue on. We praise you. And we can do this forever in Jesus' name. Amen.
because Jesus is alive and we have a living hope and Father we pray that you will take our praises as sacrifices of love to you and that you will teach us by your Holy Spirit convict us in areas that we need convicting challenge where we need challenge comfort where we need comfort we pray Father that your word will go forth with power throughout the world today, not just from this pulpit, from, from, but from all of those who are serving the true Lord Jesus Christ. We pray in his name. Amen. You may be seated. Just for information's sake, uh, you need to be aware that uh, Les Russell passed away this past uh, Friday night, I believe it was. Yeah, Friday night. So it's Belinda's husband. Uh, he's not been doing well for some time, but this came up very suddenly, very quickly. So Belinda's doing fine uh, as, as far as a person can be when you lose a spouse. But uh, I think it would be nice just to... Be an encouragement, keep her in prayer, uh, just share your love with her, and uh, she, she would appreciate that, I'm very sure. Well, this is a strange title, isn't it? Divine Destruction or Deliverance? It almost uh, makes me feel like I'm going to be doing a Lego sermon. <laughs> Destruction of all the Lego pieces, or I'm going to be rescued someplace, but... One of the things that uh, we find is a great source of encouragement and uh, comfort is the fact that God is in control. And we refer to that as being God as being sovereign, right? God's in total control. And along with that thought is the knowledge that God will one day condemn the unrighteous and rescue the righteous. Just as he's going to rescue those of us who placed our trust and faith in him, he's also going con to condemn those who have rebelled and rejected Jesus Christ. Now you and I understand that the only ones <coughs> Just got that frog woke up again. The only ones who are truly righteous are those who have chosen Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior, right? Just because you say you're a Christian doesn't mean you are a Christian. You have to have personally accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior. Now, continue with what I've just said with the reality that God cannot and he will not lie. God never does something and says, just kidding. Because God is truth. God is truth. Then, if that's the case, think about this. False teachers and deceivers are not dealing with truth, are they? 
And even though they say they may speak on behalf of God, they're actually calling God a liar because they're saying something that his word does not say. They're saying that God made a mistake, that times are different today. Well, when reading today's passage and the guarantee of destruction to those who deal in lies and deception and rebellion, it underscores the reality that one day God will judge them in his perfect righteousness. Now, that, I'm not saying all this that you and I go around gloating and cheering and stuff like that. No, this should give us some sorrow because they had the opportunity but they've chosen to reject it. Then we continue to look at these verses, and we see good news here, don't we? We see that those people who follow righteousness, who follow after Jesus Christ, we are guaranteed deliverance, just as God has also promised in his word. So you and I, can be encouraged that God will do what he has promised. Do you buy that? If not, you're going to have to buy it because I'm going to show you this in God's word. We see in verse 3, the last part, some interesting things. Because we ask the question, will God be true to his word? And will those who mock God and attack anything that has to do with Jesus, are they going to get away with their behavior like it seems that they are right now? Or will there actually be consequences? And you see from my first point that God will be able to finalize condemnation. Look at the verse here. Their judgment from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. So from what Peter is writing, even though it may not look like anything was going to happen, or the judgment was going to take place, according to Peter, it's a done deal. It's a done deal. Because there will indeed be a day of reckoning. There will be a time when God condemns those who choose to manipulate the truth of the Bible and twist it around for their own ends. It's been set since before the beginning. And in fact, the judgment was set when the serpent or Satan or Lucifer used God's word, twisted it around, called God a liar, basically, when he deceived Eve. And God said that he was to be condemned. Now on this earth, it seems that in our modern culture, it seems that many people insist on being tolerant to the point that they simply will not disagree when there's false information being taught about God, they're just silent. Or they're saying, well, that may be your truth. But we do need to speak up. We need to point out error when there is error. We need to confront the individuals who are saying they speak for God but in reality, they're speaking for Satan because they're twisting God's words. And you might think, well, why would you want to do that? Well, possibly for the benefit of them that they might understand truth, they might repent of their sin, and that they would seek Jesus Christ to be their Savior. I mean, we don't just want them all blasted with a laser beam. In fact, Jesus doesn't want that. The Bible says he's not willing that any should perish. It gives God no pleasure in condemning people. 
but he does so based upon their own choices. Because if they continue on, there will be condemnation, judgment, and destruction. So in verses 4 through 8, we, we find ourselves, how do we know that there will be a condemnation? Well, first of all, we have to remember that God is still sovereign. God is in charge. And he is able to bring to completion our choices. The completion will be either heaven or hell. So God was able to fulfill choices. Let's look at these verses. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to pits of darkness reserved for judgment, and did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a preacher of righteousness, with seven others, when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly, and if he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to destruction by reducing them to ashes, having made them an example to those who would live ungodly lives thereafter. Thereafter keeps on going and going and going. And if he rescued Lot, oppressed by the sensual conduct of unprincipled men, oh, if he rescued righteous Lot, just about jumped over that word because it doesn't seem to fit, but we'll get more on that. For by what he saw and heard, that righteous man, while living among them, felt his righteous soul tormented day after day by their lawless deeds. Here Peter takes some time to give us several examples of how God has worked in the past, leading us to understand that he is quite able to do the same today and tomorrow. And when Peter uses the word special in the beginning here, uses the word if, it would probably be more helpful to us in our English understanding if we would substitute the word if for since. Okay, because that's, the, that's the, what the word if means in this particular case. Since God did not spare angels, he didn't, you remember. And if you don't remember, let's talk about it. Because it's in my notes. Peter starts out by discussing the fallen angels. Now that would include Satan or Lucifer, as well as the other angels who rebelled against God. Now the Bible does not give us a whole lot of specifics. It doesn't give us details. doesn't describe exactly when and where and how things took place. We do have some information from Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28. Revelation 12 also tells us that a third of the angels rebelled against God and were cast from heaven. Now there's all kinds of people that like to conjecture. All kinds of books written, all kinds of ideas written. We just don't have a lot that we can go on here except for the fact that those who rebelled against God are punished. Now, these fallen angels are commonly referred to as demons, and they're working for Satan. Now, we need to remember a couple of things here. These demons and Satan, none of them are om om omnipotent. None of them are omniscient. None of them are omnipresent. Now, some of you might be saying, come again, they're not omni-something. In other words, none of them are all-powerful. None of them are all-knowing. Which, by the way, they can't know your thoughts. The Bible nowhere describes them as knowing your thoughts. The one who knows your thoughts is the Spirit of God. Now, obviously, Satan and his cohort, they can observe the stupid things we do, right? You observe something stupid, you're going to try and take advantage of it. 
It's not because they read your mind. They're not omnipresent. They can't be everywhere at once. We have some strange teaching and some strange, by good people. People who love the Lord, but they've elevated Satan and his workers to a place they don't belong. So remember that. And if God did not let them go, and by the way, there's no get out of jail card for the demons. It's a one-time thing. You mess, you mess up with God, you're done. If you're an angel. There are some angels that appear to be locked up in a place almost lower than hell, Tartarus. Now, you and I know that angels are not chained up by literal chains, right? You know that, right? Say yes. Like, I, I think you know it. Now, if you don't know that, let me tell you why. Because angels are spirit beings. So you can't lock an angel up. But God can confine them. He can restrict them. Basically, he's saying they are kept in a place where they have no freedom of movement. They cannot do anything. They don't have anybody on the outside to whom they can communicate. We don't know why a certain number are there. There are theories. I'm not going to go into them because they're kind of far-fetched. But what we do know here is that angels are not immune to being condemned and punished for rebellion against God. And if that's the case, and it is, then you and I can know that any human who dares to defy God and rebel against him will also receive punishment. Is that a fair analogy by Peter? has to be because the Holy Spirit inspired it. Another example is found from Genesis 6 in what we refer to as the Noahic flood. Noah's flood, the flood of Noah, the great deluge, etc., etc. My family and I had the wonderful opportunity to go to Branson, Missouri for the last part of our vacation and we went to Sight and Sound Theater. Has anybody been to Sight and Sound Theater? There's one in Pennsylvania and one in Branson. Oh, Marco. Uh, what a convenience. How about that? Uh, coincidence, not a convenience. Wow. Uh, but anyway, they did Noah. And it was phenomenal. I, I went in and bought a digital copy sometime. I'm going to figure out how to use it. And I'll have to invite a bunch of you over to watch it. It was just amazing. Absolutely amazing. But beyond the technical aspect of how amazing it was, the story just came to life. It was astounding because as all the stuff is going on with Noah and all the people around the surrounding area, you felt as if I'm living this right now. This type of stuff is going on in the world right now. This hatred for God is going on all around the world right now. This idea that we know better because we're in the majority is going on right now. And, and it's just, it was so amazing to me. But what, what I want to point out to you is that before this destruction took place, it took 120 years to build the ark. Can you imagine... How would you like to have a job 120 years later and find it's going to be completed? That hammer would have been worn out several times over. 120 years. But Noah didn't spend that whole time just building the ark. You know what else he was doing? He was preaching. He was preaching about the need to repent and the need to turn to God. And everyone did not believe him except for his own family. They rejected the message. In fact, Jesus even commented in Luke chapter 17 that life was going on just like every other day 
until the very day that Noah's family entered into the ark. Think about that. Life will be going on just like every other day until judgment comes down. Talk about a minority witness. Having the very truth of God presented to them, all the neighbors, all the surrounding areas, everyone else rejected that truth. They chose to believe a lie, thinking that their ways were the right ways. After all, Noah's kind of a kook. He's got sons and daughters-in-law and a wife. They're just as kooky as he is. Why should we believe him? Where is God? We don't need God. We're having plenty of fun doing what we want to do. After all, 99% of the world thought they were right. I don't know what the numbers are. Probably more than that. But Noah and his family chose to believe God. So God fulfilled choices. Judgment and destruction came by a flood. In fact, the word for flood that Peter uses is where we get the word cataclysm. Those who chose rebellion, those who chose to reject the message of truth, they were condemned and utterly destroyed. But those who chose to believe and obey God were saved. Then we go to another example in verses 6 through 8. Two cities, Sodom and Gomorrah, and a guy named Lot. That sounds like an old 60s ballad, doesn't it? The situation is described back in Genesis 18 and 19. Historically, it takes place about 450 years after the flood. Wow, how quickly people forget. The NIV describes the lifestyle of the residents of these two cities as filthy lives of lawless men. Filthy lives of lawless men. And I looked at that and I thought, Lawless. What law? The law of Moses hadn't been given yet. What law could it possibly have been? It was the law of God that was written on their hearts. Scripture defines it as. Something we should remember is that many places in the Bible, including the New Testament, contrary to what some people want to believe, not only did Jesus speak against it, but Paul spoke against it in Romans 1, chapter 24 through 27, describes this activity as unnatural sex, sodomy, homosexual behavior. This is condemned throughout the Bible. It is never of God, but it comes from the depravity of man. If I start beating my children and my wife, and I tell you, that's just the way God made me, is that going to give me an excuse? Why would I beat my children and wife? Because I'm making wrong choices. What if I decide I don't like the way your nose is sitting on your face, so I'm going to shoot you? That's just, that's just how God made me. No? No? Is it possible for God to make someone who practices homosexuality? No. I mean, he made them, but he didn't make them to do that. That was a choice they made. Now, lest you online and those of you in here think I'm being hating, hateful against those in the homosexual community, I'm not. I'm not. Because I invite any 
anybody of any belief system in here to hear the word of God. And let the word of God be the focus. But I will not call God a liar and say, well, you just made that person that way even though you condemn it. No, that's, that's ridiculous. That's making God to be something he cannot be nor is. Once again, God fulfilled their evil choices by total destruction. Make no mistake about it, folks. I want you to know that I preach Jesus Christ is able to save anybody from any sin. Period. It's, if it's a sin of arrogance, that's just as easy going to keep you out of heaven as a sin of homosexuality. Please understand that. Now the whole issue of homosexuality does have a little bit greater impact in the fact that the scriptures describe sexual sin as being even more intense than other sin because it involves the entirety of who a person is. The word for destruction that Peter uses is where we get the word for catastrophe. It's total catastrophe. In fact, to my knowledge, archaeologists have not discovered any artifacts, remains, anything of Sodom and Gomorrah. It was totally annihilated, wiped out. Sodom and Gomorrah are referred to at least 20 times in the Bible in a very negative sense and as a warning for all of us in the future. Even writers and playwrights refer to Sodom and Gomorrah in a negative sense. Current contemporary ones. One of the crimes in the law books is listed as sodomy because of this situation. Now I look at this and I say, wow, that was terrible, but Lot's not much better. I mean, he's not an example of a righteous guy, is he? Yeah, Peter refers to him having righteousness twice in this section. I mean, he chose to stay in this area when Abraham gave him a choice because, hey, it looked pretty good. Rich, fertile soil, lot of opportunity. I'm going for that. My uncle Abraham doesn't know what he's talking about. I'm going for this. Abraham let him. Did you know that Lot had four daughters? He had four daughters. Two of them were already married. Remember when he tried to convince them to come? The sons-in-law and the daughters just laughed at him. And they ended up staying. He had two unmarried virgin daughters. Sadly, he offered them to this horrible community to do unspeakable things. And fortunately, the angels wouldn't let this happen. Lot must not have been a very powerful witness. Even his wife didn't listen to what she was told and turned back and was assaulted. I had to lighten it up somehow. So Lot was self-centered. We know later on he's prone to drunkenness. Not very protective of his family. And even though he was far from perfect, Peter refers to him as having righteousness. And the only way you can have that is having pursued a relationship with God. In fact, Peter describes Lot in this way. He says he was oppressed by the sensual conduct of unprincipled men. He felt his righteous soul tormented day after day by their lawless deeds. And yet God rescued him. Folks, doesn't that encourage you? How many times 
what I say, okay, am I Noah? Or I haven't really said this, but think about it for a little bit with me. You just humor me. I have a choice. I want to be Noah or I want to be Lot. Both of them are rescued, right? I want to be Noah, don't you? And yet how many times am I Lot? I'm saved, but boy, I do some dumb things. Do you? I mean, don't raise your hands, obviously, but we, we all do. And so I look at this and I say, because of my belief in Jesus Christ, I am going to be rescued. It's not based upon what I do. It's based upon who I know. In these verses, we definitely see the rebellion against God will be dealt with in condemnation, don't we? But I also believe that we can be encouraged as believers that God is able to fill our choice of following him by providing us salvation, by protecting us from being tainted by an evil world. And then one day, complete rescue from condemnation when we are present with Christ. And I see here, as I look at this, that Noah was able to stay righteous, not because he was disciplined, not because he was bullheaded, but because God enabled him and he made the choice to follow and believe God, even in the midst of an incredibly corrupt and wicked world. And he didn't isolate himself from the world. He didn't isolate himself from the world. He engaged them. In fact, Noah was preaching to those who were rebellious against God as often as he could. And Noah and his family were spared judgment by being shut into the ark and lifted above the destruction. Peter was encouraging the believers to whom he was writing that God was able to rescue them in the midst of their troubling situation. Whether it be from a corrupt government, as we saw in the last book, or from false teachers, as we're seeing here, that were infiltrating their local assemblies, trying to create confusion and division. He reminds them God is sovereign. We sometimes will say, we reap what is sown. We see the last part in verse 9, first part of verse 10, almost like a summary to the earlier verses. Peter further clarifies that since God was able in the past to accomplish his purposes and will, he is also able to do so in Peter's time. And brothers and sisters, he's able to do so in our time as well. It doesn't necessarily mean we're going to be kept safe physically and stuff like that. But we're going to be kept safe spiritually. We are going to be protected by God in the fact that no one can take us away from God. Look at these verses and see what is said here. Then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from temptation and to keep the unrighteous under, under punishment for the day of judgment, and especially those who indulge the flesh in its corrupt desires and despise authority. You know, it may look like things are very topsy-turvy and out of control. It may look like the wicked are prospering. It may look like those who are following after Christ are not being protected. But Peter reminds us the unrighteous will be punished. Those who despise authority, who choose to teach false doctrine, who choose to promote evil, wicked lifestyles contrary to scripture, they will be punished. The false teachers had truly despised and rejected the lordship of Jesus Christ, even though they said that they did believe in Jesus. 
But you know what? As Christians, we don't need to worry about judgment for condemnation. Why? Jesus Christ took our condemnation on the cross at Calvary. Just as with Noah, when judgment comes, we will have been rescued and kept safe. I like the first part of verse 9 especially. The Lord knows how to rescue the godly from temptation. Isn't that encouraging? Don't sweat it. He knows how to take care of this. God's not caught off guard saying, oh, well, now what do I do? That's not even in God's vocabulary. The idea behind temptation here, terrible, wicked idea. Boy, that was very German of me, wasn't it? Uh, it was, it's the idea that someone is setting a trap, trying to lure an innocent individual into a harmful situation so that they can be destroyed. That's what we have going on right now. But not only have we been rescued from the condemnation of hell, but we're also able to be rescued from temptation. We see temptation, we don't have to walk towards it because it's meant to destroy us. And so we can live life victoriously in Christ today regardless of what is going on all around us. Well, let me leave you with some words of challenge and encouragement. First of all, we don't want to be separatists while on this earth because the world needs to hear words of rescue and salvation. Chuck just shared with me in the last service something which just blessed me tremendously. This BLM and Antifa and all that that's going on out in Oregon right now, it seems that a group of Christians went out and met with them and served them hot dogs. I, that, that could be considered torture, but anyway. They served them hot dogs, and they began to develop a relationship with them. And they began talking and having dialogue together, non-violently. I thought, wow, what an example like Noah. Knowing they're going to hell, and I can say that very bluntly, I'm sorry if it offends you, but if you've rejected Christ and if you refuse to live your life in obedience to Christ, you're going to hell, plain and simple. But knowing that, these people went out there and proclaimed Jesus. That cup of cold water in Jesus' name, or in this case, a hot dog. We also don't want to compromise with the world and become so much like the world that our message is not taken seriously. What, what breaks my heart is when I hear people in the church make comments, well, everybody else is doing it. I don't see why I can't do it. Or I'm not hurting anybody else. But does it match with what the Bible says? Is it walking and living in obedience to the Bible? So don't be discouraged by the state of this world. I see that it is filled with evil. And I also am saddened by the fact that there are many people who accept this evil, even in the church, to the point where they say, God must have been wrong. Because one day judgment will happen. And my friends, when judgment happens, there is not going to be another opportunity to accept Jesus Christ. That's it. I'm greatly encouraged by the examples that we read here. Regardless of how strong any Christian might be, regardless of how weak any Christian might be, God will rescue us because, my friends, he is more than able. Amen. But I, I find it fascinating to know that judgment could not take place until the righteous had been removed and rescued. 
So I'm going to give you a little end times theology here. I've never used this passage to go this way, but I thought, isn't it fascinating how it fits in? Uh, some of you know, most of you probably know, that I'm a pre-tribulationist. In other words, I believe the church will be raptured up before the tribulation period begins. There are many who disagree with me, and that's okay because I'm right. No. <laughs> I look at this passage here, and I, I see some amazing things. Noah had to be shut up in the ark with his family and protected from judgment, lifted above the judgment. The rain couldn't start coming for judgment until Noah was removed. Then judgment came. Because judgment is for what? Rebellion against God. It's for unrighteousness. Lot. Lot. Now an angel had to drag him out. For some of us at the rapture, it may be that. But Lot was removed from the city. Fire and brimstone could not come down for judgment until the righteous was removed. We know that God's wrath will be poured out during the tribulation period, right? The revelation of Daniel tells us that. It's God's wrath for unbelief. Okay? Why would the church have to endure that? Because God's wrath was poured out on Jesus Christ on the cross for my sin. And if I am supposed to undergo and endure his wrath, then Jesus' death was not enough. Now, even though I say that's theology, I want you to know, I think theology's fun. And this is great because I am encouraged that God is able to deliver and to rescue his own out of judgment. Do you see that? Do you see? Isn't that wonderful? Now, how many of you thought I'd come up with that out of this passage? But it's there. It's there. Is God able to do all that he says he's going to do? Yes. Absolutely. Oh, you're good. Nine o'clock service, take note. He absolutely is. But sadly, for those who refuse to believe, who even try to teach falsehood to God's people, there will most definitely be destruction. But for those of us who have accepted Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior, there is and there will be divine deliverance. Because we can be encouraged that God will do what he has promised. Amen? Amen. Let's stand as we pray together. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for your word. We are so grateful for your Holy Spirit who enlightens and teaches and instructs, guides. We just are so praising you for the reality that you are able to rescue your children, that you are able to preserve us and to keep us for heaven. And Father, we also recognize with solemnity that those who reject Jesus Christ will one day face eternal judgment. So Lord, keep us ever mindful that we might proclaim Christ in all that we say and all that we do, that we will be bold in sharing the love of Jesus, not in an argumentative fashion, but in a loving, caring, winsome way. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.